now uh, move to the, the main event, which is Professor Diane Coyle. Uh, Diane will be known to many of you who read the newspapers. Uh, she is an authority uh, on economics. She's, she leads the relatively new Productivity Institute uh, here in Cambridge, connected to other centres in the UK. She's part of the new um, Bennett Institute for Public Policy, uh, and she's a fellow here in this college. Uh, we have quite a lot on science and engineering in this society, um, and we don't always connect it through to the impact on the economy. Uh, and that's one of the conundrums in this country. Why don't we get the productivity uh, out of the economy that we would expect, given such a strong science base? Um, I'm hoping, Diane, you're going to tell us. Um, I'm just going to make sure I'm on camera for the people at home. I did an event last week. And the uh, person hosting the event said, it's marvellous to have humans in the room after all this time talking to those things online. I appreciate that there are humans online as well, so welcome to everybody. Good evening, everybody. And um, I'm not sure I can actually answer Mike's question fully, but I'm, I'm going to do my best. As he said, I, I'm an economist. I have been for many years now doing my own research on the digital economy which has transformed the way we spend our time in our daily lives, has transformed business, and actually crystallizing the effects that that has had on the economy and measuring them is, is hard enough. Um, so I'm going to talk about this, this my, my, my essay question, what is the productivity puzzle, why does it matter, and, and what's causing it? And um, I'm very aware that I'm speaking to an audience of non-economists, so if anybody hears some jargon that you uh, don't, um, uh, don't understand or want me to clarify, do some kind of jargon klaxon and I'll explain what I'm, what I'm trying to talk about. Uh, I thought I'd better start with some definition of terms. And so here they are. We talk about two kinds of productivity. One is labour productivity, which is much easier to measure. And that is, roughly speaking, the output of the economy or a sector of the economy divided by the number of workers. And that sounds pretty straightforward. It's what do you get out for what you put in, in, in terms of labour. It gets a bit more complicated because by output, we don't mean the number of things coming off a production line or the number of management consultancy reports. We think about the revenues because that reflects the prices that people pay, which we take to reflect their preferences and their needs, the things that they want to purchase. And then we turn that into what we describe as real terms by dividing by a price index. There's a wonderful quote from the economist Thomas Schelling, a Nobel Prize winner, saying, um, the only real figure is the nominal pounds figure, and what we call real is completely hypothetical. And that's absolutely correct. So you always see in newspaper reports when they talk about GDP growth, they're talking about it in real terms, and that means essentially this analytical construct, which has been created in very complex statistical procedures based on lots of surveys and divided by a price index, itself equally complicated and turned into this thing called real output. We also try to adjust for the quality of the workforce, so as people get more educated, um, that's um, uh, reflected in more labour, if you like, more uh, better quality labour. And if you're thinking about labour productivity, giving workers more capital to work with is going to increase labour productivity, which we call capital deepening. And just think about a building site where you've got somebody who is digging the spade and somebody who's got a bulldozer, and it's clear that you're going to get more work, more output from the one who's got the bulldozer. So that's the idea there. And a lot of the press reports talk about labour productivity because that's relatively straightforward to measure, despite all the complexities I just mentioned. We also have this concept of multi-factor or total factor productivity, which takes account not only of labour input, but capital services inputs as well. So if you've got a machine in the factory, the statistician is going to try to measure the service that you get from that machine as part one of the inputs. We still want to get output for the inputs that you're putting in, and this time we're including capital. Increasingly, there's a move to think about inputs that we haven't traditionally used to measure total factor productivity, and a lot of the attention is focused on intangibles. 
Um, so things like software or database assets or um, brand values and reputation, now management quality, all of these things trying to be measured. Um, to some degree also material inputs, but they tend to um, be treated differently in the calculation, which is a bit of an oddity. And that leaves us with multi-factor productivity being um, the improvement in ideas, the, Im the technological progress. Now you'll notice that if you take account of more and more inputs, then your measured total factor productivity is going to be smaller. And it was famously named as the measure of our ignorance. It's the measure of what's happening in the economy that we can't attribute to any of the inputs. So you'll get the idea that this is a slightly strange beast and it's very different from anything an, uh, uh, an engineer might think of as productivity or efficiency. And I think the key thing is that we're trying to capture in that some sense of what it is that people in society value in the decisions that they make, whether, whether they're consumers or producers. So that's the terms, the terminology. And um, this is the puzzle. So here in this chart, I've given you labour productivity in the UK, so the simpler of those two measures, which you can see rising pretty steadily up until the mid-2000s, and then sort of flatlining. The chart also gives you what would have happened if the earlier trend had continued. And the gap now between a continuation of the earlier trend and what we've actually got is 20%. So a one-fifth gap has opened up that we don't know how to explain. And just decomposing it, you can see in the chart, or at least I can see it if I put my glasses back on, um, that part of that is because investment is a bit lower than it was previously, and that's the blue bars, the less capital deepening. Small adjustments for labour quality having gone down. People talk a lot about um, the use of unskilled labour in the economy being one of the drivers of um, lower productiv flatter productivity, but that's a small part of the story. And then this yellow uh, bar, the biggest part, um, something seems to have gone wrong with the process of um, idea generation, turning what we have into better output that we value. So 20% is a big gap to try to explain. And these, a pattern like this is really unusual e in economic statistics. Normally, they're either very volatile and go up and down a lot, or you get reasonably smooth trends. So to have something that hits a point like that and then turns flat is really unusual. And that's why it's a puzzle. Um, there's another part of the puzzle, which is that we in the UK are doing worse than other OECD economies. So it's happening throughout all of the rich economies, but worse here than elsewhere. And so the gap for the rest of the G7 is much less than that 20%. It's more like 12% or so, I think. So we've got to explain, first of all, why it's gone flat everywhere and why it's worse in the UK than elsewhere. So those are the two components of the puzzle. And this is why it matters. So you'd have uh, listened to me talk about the first slide and thought, well, that's a little bit strange. What is this beast productivity we're talking about? It's an artificial construct. Um, but you can see from this chart that actually real earnings track reasonably closely what happens with productivity. Not entirely, and it used to be much closer in the past before the start of this chart, but if productivity doesn't go up, then the scope for real earnings doesn't go up either. And so again, there's been a flatlining in real earnings pretty much since around the time of the financial crisis or a little bit before. So this is why we care about it. Getting more out of the inputs that we have available is what makes it possible for people's standard of living to rise over time. And so if you have flat productivity, you're going to have flat real earnings. And that seems to have brought all kinds of um, political conflict and discontent in its wake. One of the arguments about the political surprises that are occurring in many countries is that it reflects the discontent of people who for a decade or more haven't seen their real incomes go up. And um, the US is a particularly stark example there because median household earnings, the typical household, has not seen an increase in its living standards for a very long time indeed. So that's why we care about it. And this is even more dramatic if I look over a very long time period. This is what's been happening to real <coughs> average earnings in the UK. This chart goes back to 
pretty much the dawn of the Industrial Revolution. And it's got that typical shape of all economic theories, except right at the end when it, when it dips substantially. And that kind of dec decrease in earnings, real earnings, living standards over a sustained number of years is the worst since the Napoleonic Wars. So this is really quite an unprecedented um, context to be trying to understand. And this is one reason that the ESRC set up the Productivity Institute, which is its biggest ever single investment, headquartered in Manchester, but we're one of the major hubs for it here in Cambridge. And it's interdisciplinary, so we're working with colleagues in engineering and political science in the business school in psychology and economics and polis to try to understand um, what's driving this flatlining and what we can do about it. So that's the bit about why it matters. I've told you what it is. I've told you why it matters. Now I'm going to tell you there are different ways to think about it. So if we want to diagnose this, we can think about um, slicing the data in different ways. Uh, we can think about it by sectors. And so here I have given you what's happened to different sectors of the economy, comparing the post-financial crisis period with the previous um, uh, equivalent period. And you can see that, not surprisingly, finance and insurance are less productive than they were before the financial crisis, and that's not particularly surprising. Um, but some of the others are more surprising. Why in ICT and uh, professional and scientific activities would there have been this decrease in productivity between the two periods? And, and why in manufacturing? And when you look at these different patterns, you start to wonder, um, are we looking for a single explanation for the whole economy or do we have to actually go into this detail about what's happening in different sectors? To what extent can we find a universal solution to the puzzle or is it going to be a lot of different things going on? Similarly, if you look at regions of the economy, the pattern's very different. And famously, London and the Southeast are much more productive and haven't seen quite the same slowdown despite being um, heavily dependent on financial services. Or you can look at different firms, so never mind which sector they're operating in, let's have a look at what's happening at the level of different um, companies and try to understand what's driving it there. Is it management quality? Is it the way that they are using new digital technologies? Have they got better um, process efficiencies? Are some of them better at exporting than others? And so we're trying to diagnose it by diving in through these different lenses to understand what's going on. So uh, we've got lots of possible culprits. This is Murder on the Orient Express, of course, and they all turned out to be guilty. And it could be the case with the productivity puzzle as well. It could just happen to be the case that the financial services sector is less productive because they've got a debt overhang and they've got a greater burden of compliance than they used to. Or it could be that... Um, there has been, there's been trade disruptions in manufacturing which explain that slowdown when world trade slowed post-2008 and now we've added Brexit on top of that. Or um, it could be that we've got an ageing population and maybe demography is playing a part and that's affecting labour quality in ways that we haven't taken account of. And so there are many, many possible culprits. And um, so one of the things that I focused on is thinking about these definitions and how we do the measurements. Because it is really surprising to think about the extent to which companies have restructured themselves over the past uh, 10 or 20 years. Uh, the outsourcing to different um, suppliers, often across borders, as we are now discovering with all of the, sh all of the shortages and supply chain issues. Um, or the immense adoption of digital technologies in some parts of the economy. The fact that we're all now um, using mobiles and um, tablets so much that the use of data in the economy has absolutely soared. Can it really be the case that all of these phenomena have reduced productivity? Because if so, why on earth are people doing it? What explains that behaviour by companies if um, outsourcing and extending the supply chain is actually going to reduce productivity? They must be expecting to get some benefit out of it. And the benefit you'd expect is greater specialisation, which is what seems to have happened. So I've been focusing on measurement questions. 
And this is one of the studies that um, I did with colleagues at the Office for National Statistics and the Institute of Engineering and Technology. So very much cross-disciplinary. And the panel on the left shows you two alternative price indices. So remember I said we're measuring real output. We're taking the revenues of the telecommunications sector and dividing that by a price index. And the pale blue line at the bottom is what the official figures said had happened to the price of telecommunications over that period, which in this chart is 1998 to 2016. And when you say that to an engineer, they say, well, that means that um, real output growth has been very slow because you've got this flat price index. Um, but that's kind of absurd because we know that the amount of data use has increased, that the technologies have improved, there's much more compression, the lower latency. You can't be taking account of any of these quality improvements. And so your price index must be wrong because prices properly understood in telecommunications have been declining incredibly rapidly. And if that weren't the case, people wouldn't be using so much of it. And data usage has increased exponentially. So we calculated some different price indices. One of the ones was just a unit value index. You take the revenues and you divide by the number of bytes of data that get used. And rather than showing a flat line, that showed a 95% decrease over that same period in the price, and therefore a much bigger increase in measured real output. The Office of National Statistics wasn't quite that brave, and so they went for something intermediate where we changed the weights on different components of the services, so on SMS messages and WhatsApps and uh, voice, traditional voice calls and so on, and um, came up with this index that you've got in the chart, which is about a 35% decline, I think. And they fed that through the national statistics into the GDP figures, and it changed the profile of GDP growth, which feeds into productivity measurement uh, in the way that you can see on the right-hand panel. So it doesn't look very much. It shows you the pale blue line is the new one in this case, the, ex the experimental figures, although they're now official. And you can see that um, there's a bit less growth before the financial crisis in the sector and a bit more, more growth, uh, sorry, GDP before the financial sector and a bit more growth afterwards. But what we've done, in effect, is add 0.16 percentage points to GDP growth post-2010. Uh, and in the world where you think a 0.2% increase in a quarter is big, that's, that's you know, quite a big deal. And indeed, it was part of my impact case study. Uh, increasing GDP without doing anything is what all politicians would love to be able to do. Um, so we've done this for telecommunications services. But there are lots of parts of the economy that are very hard to measure in the way that we want to, to understand productivity in the economist sense. And so we started to think about, well, what do we actually mean by productivity? I said earlier that total factor productivity um, at its purest reflects ideas, technological progress. And there are examples now of um, new ideas that deliver better outcomes when nothing material at all changes. And this example is from one of my co-authors, Leonard Nakamura, who said there's this drug, um, uh, uh, I've got, now I've forgotten which way around it is, Lucentis can be used for wet macular degeneration in place of Avastin. This is something, these, these are two pharmaceutical products that already exist. Their prices haven't changed very much. One is much cheaper than the other and more effective. And so in the US, doctors are starting to prescribe the cheaper and more effective one. They're getting better patient outcomes. They're spending less money. If anything, this will reduce measured output and productivity because it's shrinking the numerator of that productivity measure by doctors spending less on what they're doing. And we're not taking account of the new idea and the improved outcome. And so there are uh, plenty of areas where you can think of this in medicine. So using mini aspirins to um, uh, avert cardiovascular disease is one example. But you could also think of things like improving the efficiency of the um, electricity grid will actually mean less output. And 
lower productivity, but that's surely a good thing. We're doing things more economically in, in an intuitive sense. And then I've done a lot of work looking at free digital services, which are, um, as, the word, as the name says, free. There's a zero price, but they come bundled with other things. How should we think about the price index that we're using here? We've switched to these uh, smartphones and tablet devices, and they now feature in a price index, so that gets captured. But on them, we have um, a clock, a calculator, a diary, a notebook, all kinds of um, physical things, radios, TVs that we used to buy and now don't, and they're sort of free, so we're paying for the service and we're paying for the device. We have no idea, really, what's happening to the price indices and how that's affecting the measurement of output in the digital sector of the economy, which is, of course, more and more of the economy. We don't have the data. It's actually very hard to collect from the digital giants the data that you need to answer these questions. For example, cloud computing has become quite a big thing in uh, the corporate sector. Very big companies and government agencies now do it. Uh, startups do it. And that doesn't get counted as part of GDP because rather than investing in their own computer servers and hiring their own data scientists, companies are now purchasing these services from cloud providers. And that gets subtracted from GDP because GDP is a value added measure. It's only the net output that gets created by companies that's counted in there. And anyway, we don't know how much of it's going on. We don't have the data for the communications flows. Um, we don't even really know what the right volume units are to think about that. And that's part of the problem in thinking about productivity in the way the economy has become. Because I think many economists have this intuitive sense of, um, you know, washing machines rolling off the production line. You can make the process more efficient. You can make the washing machine a bit better. You can count the number of washing machines and you know what they're sold for. Well, most of the economy isn't like that anymore. So 25% I've got in this chart, um, this matrix. I've divided this um, into can, what can you observe? Can you observe quantity and quality and price? Uh, sorry, quantity and quality. Uh, and there are three permutations of that going down and going across. Do you observe the price or do you not observe the price? So we can measure productivity most easily where you can observe quantity, you can observe price, and you can adjust for quality change. And that's about one-fifth of the economy. And all the rest, there's something that you don't measure. Uh, so financial services uh, is in that sector in the middle of the right-hand column because for most financial services, there's no observed price. You're looking at a spread on trades in financial markets, and that's that... Um, uh, acronym FISM, Financial Intermediation Services Indirectly Measured. And the free digital services come in there too. And then there are things going on like household production. That's the unpaid work that we do in the home. It's caring for people, it's cooking meals and so on. And there have been moves across what we would call the production boundary, what gets counted in GDP and what doesn't get counted in GDP because of digital technologies. So I don't have to go and... Um, talk to a, a person in the bank, I can do my banking online. And I don't need to go to a travel agent, I can fix that online and I get much more choice and uh, uh, I can customise it exactly the way I want to so I get better quality as well. Just as women going out to work from the household economy into the paid economy boosted productivity in the 1960s and 1970s, maybe there's a bit of a reverse move that's reducing measured productivity now. So this goes back to my list of culprits. If I'm thinking only about measurement questions, there's actually a lot of culprits to think about in there. And that's part of the, the research agenda. Then there's also this question about what do we mean by output? Um, so the right-hand panel is just some survey results from a uh, very large-scale state of preference survey we did asking people how much would they have to be paid to lose these, these free digital services for 12 months. And we asked about all kinds of online activities. So what have I given you? Online learning, Netflix and something else, uh, online groceries. Uh, you can see how much the value of some of those changed during the pandemic. Online groceries uh, increased enormously. 
But we asked about parks as well, and there's another value that increased enormously. So people are starting to use these kinds of techniques to think about the digital bit of the picture. Can we start to assign the values that people get from using these free services that aren't already captured by paying for the tablet and paying for the data service? And this has now become quite widespread. Um, but we also, once you start thinking about going beyond the conventional GDP measurement, you start to think about other outcomes that don't get captured at all, such as health outcomes. And the quality of health isn't directly measured at all, but it, it matters tremendously, as we've seen a lot during the past two years. Should we start thinking about wider outcomes and thinking about a broader concept of productivity? And then also distribution and, and, and place, and to what extent is the productivity of the economy as a whole driven by the distribution of activity around different places and among different kinds of people. And so part of the agenda is also to think about um, outcome measures. So um, I'm going to give you a more concrete example. I'm going to come back to that one. Uh, a more concrete example of that is um, construction. The measured productivity of construction has been flat or declining for a very long time in many countries. This is a uh, crossrail near my home in West London, the family home, and it kind of encapsulates the problem. You can see it's really high tech, lots of very skilled engineering. There'll be fabulous sensors that make it easier to maintain and run. And hopefully a lot of people will get out of their cars and into public transport, so there are environmental benefits. But they started, when we bought our house in 1992, the estate agent said to us, and very soon you'll have the benefit of um, Crossrail on your doorstep in central London, boosting the house price. What a great purchase you're making. And that was quite a long time ago, and it's not fully running yet. Um, so on the one hand, there's all of this skill and technology going into it. On the other hand, it's very slow. It hasn't delivered yet. And the gains from reduced maintenance, reduced downtime, and environmental benefits aren't actually getting captured in the figures that we're using. So we're, I have a paper which I'm delighted to be calling Digital Concrete, uh, which is looking at this at the moment. But let me go back now, if I can, to where I stopped. I said at the start, the UK does a lot of this worse than other countries. And I've got a list of culprits here, some of which date back a long time. We had inquiries about some of these in the 1930s. Uh, finance for growing firms, for example, it's a long-standing problem in the UK. Questions about skills, do we have enough skilled workers? very prominent in the news at the moment? The answer is no, um, partly because we have changed the system of further education and techn technical education about 28 times in 40 years, so there's no stability in policy. We've got lower investment than other countries, including investment in R&D, and the government has promised to hit 2.4% of GDP, which will get us in several years' time to where the OECD average was um, a decade ago. Uh, public services and the footprint of public services has been shrinking. We've got a lower tax and spend economy than many of our uh, European neighbours. Social infrastructure, and we have these communities where all of the good jobs have shrunk. Public services have shrunk. They're places which often deindustrialized, and so the sort of meaning and purpose of life went out of them. And they have less and less of this social infrastructure as well, places where People come together and feel part of the community, can join groups like local libraries or community centres. And so on all of these fronts, we're not doing a very good job in the UK. But uh, one other area that we're looking at is actually we're really bad at policy. This is a map of the governance structure for this area, and you can see how complicated it is. It's incredibly um, fragmented, there are different tiers, Allocating responsibility for decisions in this context is a bit of a nightmare, and accountability even more, more so. So suppose some of these bodies did have uh, more spending powers than they do, how would they be held accountable? It's incredibly complicated. And there are very few parts of the country where you don't have such a complex map of governance. And why this matters is because I talked about the detail for particular sectors, particular firms, particular places. If you don't have some decision-making taking place locally, 
you're throwing away really important information. Frontier firms will often be doing something incredibly specialised and only the people who live in that area or the business organisations will know that they have these narrow specialisms. People sitting in Whitehall or even in Darlington where part of the Treasury has been moved to can't possibly know what are the seeds in the pearl that exist in Cornwall or, or East Anglia. So this complexity really matters. And the other complexity is policy change. So this is a diagram from a working paper um, of industrial policy institutions in the UK. And they, it's just incredibly complex. This is another area of policy where we have changed over and over again. In the last budget or the one before, 2019, the Chancellor abolished the Industrial Strategy Council that another Conservative government had set up in 2017. Multiple, chain, multiple industrial policies and strategies. But if it changes every two years, it's not a strategy. It's not strategic management of the economy in the way the government needs to do it. And uh, we have all of these institutions that are doing bits of industrial policy and have complex relationships with each other, overlapping responsibilities, and any sensible business is going to just ignore most of what's on offer because it's far too complicated to get your head around if you're running a business. So um, the policy and governance issues are part of what we're looking at. Um, this is a bit of a tangent. I also looked at productivity in healthcare. This is another unique UK problem. We are in red in this chart. You can see that in mid-2020, we had a much bigger fall in health output than some comparator countries, and it bounced back afterwards. At the time, there was a bit of a fuss because it fed through to the GDP figures, and the question was, why are we doing so much worse in GDP than um, similar countries? And the answer is partly methodological, that we're not measuring it the same way that they do, and there's a discussion to be had about the right way, but also because we had um, a health service that was already running hot and there was no spare capacity, we had a bigger drop in other medical procedures than other countries. So part of that drop was real, and that's going to track through to healthcare output and productivity over time. And the debate in healthcare is how much can... Um, uh, doctors and other medical staff use technology to improve productivity um, at a time when um, the space constraints and the time it takes for donning and doffing PPE and the need to run hospitals for infection control for the foreseeable future is actually reducing productivity in other ways. Um, so I talked about that. I've already mentioned the slowdown in construction productivity over many decades. So this is what we're doing about it. You know, this is a live research agenda. We don't know the answers. Uh, it's a big problem. So we are doing a number of things, partly through the Bennett Institute, partly through the Productivity Institute, um, looking at different sectors. Later this month, the Office for National Statistics will publish some new sectoral data that takes through the kind of price change that I talked about in telecommunications services. So we'll get a possibly different sectoral pattern. We'll look at that. We'll do some comparisons with international companies. For example, looking at what's happened to the productivity of some Chinese manufacturing firms in certain sectors over time. Have they caught us up? Have they overtaken us? Are they more at the frontier now in some areas? We can look at the natural experiment of labour shortages. The Prime Minister thinks that this will increase productivity. I'm a little sceptical, I have to say. But we can look at what's happening in sectors where like agriculture, where they are trying to automate because they, they can't get the labour that they need to produce in the same way as before. And we'll have a look at some areas of advanced manufacturing, particularly the geographic distribution, and are there parts of the country where, there are, there, where there's real promise for some productivity gains there. We're looking at digitalisation. Um, I'm partway through some work looking at how different firms use digital technologies. And the tentative answer is that if they buy, th buy it from um, external suppliers, their software or their websites, then they're lower productivity than companies that do it in-house and that use multiple digital technologies. So that seems to be differentiating among firms. We're looking at construction. We're looking at um, data. How, how, to what extent can companies use data effectively to produce more efficiently? 
through the um, Productivity Institute, we have a regional forum that brings together policymakers and businesses and academics from around the region. And they are interested in understanding skill needs, particularly sort of mid-level skills, technical skills that are needed in the Cambridge cluster or in high value food proce processing and so on. And also at different parts of the region, which are very different from each other and the big projects going on in the Fens. And then uh, other colleagues are looking at these governance questions. Um, what are the right kinds of uh, governance structures? Should we be devolving more decisions? Do we have the right institutions for R&D? How should we think about productivity and electricity taking account of environmental targets and environmental risks? Can you risk adjust productivity and think about output adjusted for carbon emissions? And thinking about um, SMEs using digital tools. So it's a very broad array of work and there's lots to read if you want to. But that's by way of saying um, we don't know the answer. There are lots of culprits and it's probably going to keep me busy for the rest of my career. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. That was uh, smashing. And uh, it's a bit of a mystery, is it not, that when we say productivity, it doesn't really mean productivity. Uh, and I think that makes we humble engineers very confused very quickly. Thank you for putting some shape and definition into it. Uh, and we'll now try harder. Um, but I think we're about ready to take some questions. And uh, the lovely Samantha will now hand around. Do the handing round and I'll ask a question over here. Thank you. Um, I'm, have I, so I've got this right, that the revenues haven't shifted up to the same extent and the real wages have stayed broadly flat in terms of, in terms of the jump off of the graph you showed us. Are you on the early graph showing productivity and wages? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So then my question becomes, if I look at since 2008, you've seen, and the rebound, you've seen a massive rebound in the net earnings, so the profitability of listed companies, which is all I can ever look at. But we haven't seen the revenue gain. So how do I square those bits up? Is it that because the profitability has improved so much, maybe they're not focusing quite as much on driving revenue growth because they don't need to because the, the, the net earnings number is better? There are probably different things going on. One is that it's been until recently a period of very low inflation, so revenue growth would be slower. But the other is that the share of output, real output that's going to labor has shrunk over time. And so there's been a redistribution to nasty capitalists who are making a higher rate of profit. Yep. And particularly um, certain companies, because lots of markets are getting more concentrated, we've got more monopoly power, more market power than we used to. So some of the lack of productivity growth is the concentration of the profits in the more concentrated sectors and the return to labor being much lower than the return to capital and more so um, the differentiation being greater the than it was. The, the sh the, it's shifted. Yeah. So if you were of a Marxist cast of mind, you might see it as um, more effective exploitation of the working yeah. classes. Thank you. Not that I am. <laughs> it's always quite good sport, Mike, isn't it? To pick people on opposite sides of the room so you make the person with the microphone run to and fro. Uh, oh, I forgot my question. Oh, no, just kidding. Um, so you mentioned R&D and how that contributes to um, how we measure productivity. I work for an R&D company. Uh, we make no profit. Uh, how would you measure labour productivity if labour productivity is a function of profit divided by the number of, or revenue divided by the number of workers? We don't make any revenue. Uh, well, indeed, R&D is a special case, and a lot of it's done in universities, which are non-profits also. And um, the question that people tend to ask there is, we've got all this fabulous R&D going on. The number of people working on R&D has gone up over time. 
how can it be that we seem to be seeing uh, fewer good ideas being turned into economic output and productivity? So as a sector of the economy, it doesn't matter that it looks like zero productivity. Um, compared to the health, measuring the health productivity, where you've got the same problem, or any public services, it's very difficult in non-profit sectors and non-market sectors to think about how you construct productivity. It's always typically been done as you count the number of people doing the work, and by definition, the productivity growth is zero. But that doesn't mean that there's no contribution. So how can we think about the contribution of R&D to downstream productivity, if you like? There's a, a well-known paper called something like, um, Are We Running Out of New Ideas? where the authors look at a lot of American data and say, actually, yes, we are. And the number of researchers is actually not delivering any greater a number of useful, economically useful ideas. I'm deeply skeptical about that, I have to say, um, because of all of those examples from the medical sector or um, the digital sector, I think we're not actually measuring that properly. So in my head, I have a, a, a paper making the contrary argument saying, why have new ideas got so hard to use rather than hard to find? And so that's all about the institutional barriers to making economic use of R&D discoveries in a way that people will pay for in the market economy. Can I come in on the, this question of whether we run out of new ideas? Um, uh, uh, James Clark Maxwell, the first Cavendish professor, in his inaugural lecture, um, s stated that it is, you know, it was generally put about that physics as a subject was physics, was finished. This is in 1874, just before relativity and quantum mechanics. But his view, Maxwell's view, is that that's rubbish, that physics is merely limited by man's imagination. Uh, so it's not a new idea that mm. we've run out of ideas. Um, and Maxwell got it right. But if I can just comment on that. But to, to come back to your wonderful lecture, I had not seen this track of real wages versus time. And having r read some of what you've written, I was getting thoroughly confused about whether it was possible to define GDP since there are so many uh, imponderables or um, illogicalities. But to what extent is um, wage growth a pretty good proxy for GDP? Is it a proxy for GDP? It depends um, which bit you're looking at. If you're looking at total incomes, then until some 15 years ago, it would have tracked GDP quite well. Since then, we've seen the shift away from labor incomes to uh, rent rentier incomes and profits that I was just talking about. And um, where I thought you were going to go with that is, um, aren't there a lot of things that people care for that we ought to be trying to include in GDP, and there's definitely a big debate going on about that at the moment. But to go back to your wonderful example about the ideas, this is quite a big debate in economics at the moment. There's a camp who say, all the big ideas have already happened, we're not going to get any more big productivity gains, and others who say, no, there are more ideas out there to be had. Robert Gordon wrote a really well-known book in the first camp, and he said, uh, clean water, sewage systems, electric lights, internal combustion, we're never going to repeat the burst of innovations that we got in the early 20th century. My view is that if we get um, clean energy generation, that will be as big a deal. And so there are definitely things to look for there. It might be much cheaper than trying to stand still. Yes. Okay. Indeed. In the sense that uh, pro productivity is such an important subject that I've thought for some time that listed companies should be required to put something in their annual report and accounts measuring their productivity. Is it practical to uh, lay down formulae that would enable them to do it on a comparable basis? Or would you have formulae for different sectors? Or would it just be useful if they show how they progress from year to year? That's an interesting question that I haven't thought about. And um, you could certainly devise measures that would be a productivity measure for individual companies. Um, it would use their revenues and it would use some measure of inputs. 
I don't think it entirely gets around the problems that I was talking about towards the end there. Um, because if you're a management consultancy, what's the volume of your output? You can measure the revenues and you know the number of consultants you employ, but you don't know anything about the quality of the service and you don't know what the volume metric will be. It's surely not the length of the PowerPoint slide deck. Um, so I think there are still some difficulties in comparing across companies, unless you don't do something very simple, which is revenues divided by number of employees or, or, or some such. Um, and we kind of have something like that reporting by asking them to report on ratio of top to median pay. So there have been moves in that direction to get at better comparability between different companies. But I'll ponder that some more. Um, this is sort of something you've touched on a bit already, but I'm sort of wondering throughout your talk how much GDP and productivity stand for something I really ought to care about. There are, you've mentioned a few ways that are not, not inaccurate, but they don't, there are many things they don't cover. Yeah. And I guess one big one is that presumably you could get GDP by millionaires becoming billionaires whilst poor people become even poorer which you know most people would say was a step backwards and free services better health outcome don't feature so are we doing the right thing looking at that or should we be looking for other more useful things to measure you touch on one of my favorite subjects because a few years ago i wrote a book called gdp a brief but affectionate history uh, which happily every sixth form student now seems to feel the need to put on their statement if they want to get into read economics at university. Um, and so th clearly there are long-standing well-known problems about thinking about GDP as a measure of what we really care about in the economy, economic welfare. Um, you can uh, have a hurricane that destroys property and that's going to boost GDP because of all the construction. We're not taking account of environmental externalities like pollution and climate change. Uh, we are not considering distribution, as you point out, and we have views about that as societies. Um, we're not taking account of all of the household labour, which by some estimates is at least as big as GDP. And as long as those things aren't changing so much, then GDP is, is a good enough measure of things getting better over time. It won't give you a sort of level reading that's accurate, but it will give you a direction reading that's accurate. And there's a chart um, called the hockey stick of history that shows um, the exponential increase of GDP from the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And this is in per capita terms as well. But my sense is that that relationship has changed and that the gap between what GDP does measure and what we care about has actually grown so big as to be, make, it, make it much less useful than it used to be. So the Bank of England and the Treasury will need to think about GDP they probably ought to think about it in nominal terms, not these pretend real terms, um, so it's needed. But that's why I think this agenda of thinking about the concepts as well as the measurements is so interesting at the moment. And maybe we'll get to somewhere better. Fingers crossed. Let me take a few uh, questions from the ether. Uh, George Perendir, if that's the correct pronunciation, says, could rapid industrial manufacturing outsourcing and FDI abroad higher than among our European peers, but without the same drop in numbers employed uh, as in the US, have contributed uh, to the overall drop of productivity and real wages? Well, that could work in different ways. Thank you, George, for the question. Um, you would expect that companies are doing this outsourcing because it increases their profit or their productivity in some sense. That would be the rationale for them doing it. Um, so the company as an entity, ought to be more productive as a result of that. But um, do they have the incentive to invest in domestic labour? I mean, that's the, that's the argument now about these areas such as haulage and agriculture, where we've got labour shortages. And the government policy for many years has been to use the shortage list uh, for immigration to incentivise British employers to train up their own people. And um, 
there's just a very complicated calculus for companies between what inputs are they going to use, what types of capital, what levels of skill of labour, and where is that going to be and where are they going to produce. And I don't think there are actually very clear patterns, and particularly as it's shifting at the moment. So I would hesitate to say a straightforward yes to that question, but it's not an implausible hypothesis. That's a long-winded way of saying I don't know the answer, really. It's an empirical question, I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and C. Gledo um, asks, isn't it true that those economies with high productivity also have high levels of unemployment? No. Uh, no, because the US and Japan are high productivity countries with low levels of unemployment. And the difference in unemployment rates is much more to do with labour market institutions than with um, any underlying productivity trends, I think. So I can think of counterexamples. So there is a question I do know the answer to. This is fantastic. But thank you for the question. The answer is a resounding no, C. Gledo. Um, and <coughs> this had better be the, the last one from the screen. Uh, Asitha Rathanayaka asks, is it fair to compare the labour productivities of different industries when their capital intensities are different? Um, so clearly, um, capital deepening is going to increase labour productivity. That's something that you would always take into account if you're comparing levels of labour productivity across sectors. We tend much more to look at growth rates and trends. And so that's why keeping an eye on, on capital deepening, as it's called, investment, is... Um, a much more standard lens for looking at it than levels. But that's absolutely right about the levels. Um, if there are any final questions from the floor, now is your last chance. But I think you've shut them all up most effectively, Diane. Uh, can I thank you on behalf of this lot and that lot out there uh, for a super talk. Um, it's really great to hear economics related to the real world there are some economists, and I wouldn't dream of mentioning names, who are very interested in mathematics, but less interested in the real world. And to see the principle of economics related to things that we can understand and need to address uh, is enormously enlightening. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you all again. The next um, uh, talk will be on the pie story. Some of you may know that uh, the foundations, some would argue, of the Cambridge phenomenon were not only in the Cavendish Laboratory, uh, but in the Pi Company, who pioneered radar, televisions, hi-fi, and all sorts of things. You'll hear that rather historical twist on uh, the evolution of Cambridge next time. Um, those of you here are welcome to repair to the bar. Uh, those of you out there are probably already drinking. We just don't know about <laughs> it. Uh, good night, everybody. See you next time.